Hi everyone, I am Jeannie Egley, the Director of Marketing at Survey Analytics, and thank you for signing up for our special webinar today on conjoint analysis and max diff scaling. I am going to introduce to you Esther Laviel, who is our VP of Client Services at Survey Analytics, and she's going to go ahead and get started with the presentation. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Gina, for the introduction. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the very last webinar of the year hosted by Survey Analytics. My name is Esther Laviel, and I'm the Vice President of Client Services here at Survey Analytics. And I've been working here for about four years and counting, and my background prior to Survey Analytics includes quali uh, qualitative and quantitative research. Um, below here on the slide, there's a bit of information about myself. I live and work in Portland, Oregon, and there's many wonderful new restaurants as well as wonderful outdoor spaces that I like to enjoy on my free time. And to the right there is a beautiful picture of the Hawthorne Bridge looking into downtown Portland. On today's webinar, we will discuss how to use Conjoint and Maxis to put your best product forward. And so on our agenda today, we will review uh, the Conjoint definitions, how to set up a conjoint question in survey analytics, conjoint analysis 101. We'll also look at max diff definitions, uh, max diff versus rating scales, um, some enhancements that we've added to the max diff question. And we'll do a live demo of both the conjoint and max diff. And if we have some time today before 11, we'll open up the floor for a Q&A. Um, keep in mind that the recording and the slides will be available after this. So um, if you are attending or if you are someone that are, would need to drop off any time during this presentation, we'll be sure to send you a copy of this as well. So let's get started here <coughs> with uh, conjoint analysis made easy with donuts. Um, I chose something really fun, so I hope you guys will enjoy this as well. Um, for me, I, I like to look at conjoint uh, analysis, kind of like a display of a display case of donuts. It's a, uh, it's a statistical technique used in market research to determine how people value different features that make up an individual product or service. And the objective for conjoint analysis is to determine what combination of a limited number of attributes that is most influential on a respondent choice or decision making. And at Survey Analytics, uh, we only support the choice based or discrete choice conjoint analysis methodology. So if you're looking for something like full profile conjoint, we don't do that here. We only use con uh, choice based conjoint here, or uh, CBC. And with a choice-based conjoint, it empowers the shopper to choose what they want to buy from you. And you, as a survey creator, are figuratively placing that survey taker in front of the display of donuts, so to speak. So um, such things such as price, flavors, and types of ingredients, textures, time of day, um, that all influences which type of donut um, they would buy at that time. So why conjoint analysis? If you're trying to determine the best combination of products or services to sell that would make you the most money, a choice-based conjoint mimics that decision-making process without actually having to physically create and sell those products and services. Um, at this point, you can be selling ideas or um, existing products um, to that target customer without actually having to physically put an investment into those products or services. It also will allow you to review any estimated market share and run simulations on concepts before deciding what's going to give you the best return on investment. And last, it's really easy to add it to your current online or mobile research strategy. Here at Survey Analytics, we really pride ourselves with having the easiest conjoint setup tool in the business. So let's go ahead and look at some conjoint definitions here. Um, 
for some people that are on this presentation, this might be a review, and for those, for some others, it might be something new that they're learning. Um, so let's go ahead and, and break down all of the definitions that you'll need to know when putting together a conjoint. So the first one here is features. Um, it's basically a prominent or distinctive aspect, quality, or characteristic that is an important part of a package of goods. So for example, we're looking at donuts as the features. And um, within there, we'll be looking at um, the next definition, which is the levels or the attributes. And that's an object or characteristic that is defined uh, related to the defined features. So from donuts, you got to look at what flavors, what kind, what type of donuts. Are you looking at plain cakes, double food cake, fruit cakes? Those can can be considered, you know, levels and attributes. And you can also look at flavors. You can also look at pricing. Those are different levels as well. Um, the levels and features um, should be set in stone prior to running your conjoint project. It's critical to the success of your project. If you don't have those uh, set in stone, then it's going to be really difficult to test and run simulations on those. Some rule of thumbs below there, um, you, you generally want to aim, especially with choice-based conjoint, um, aim for no more than five to seven features and no more than five to seven levels if you can. So it's, it should be very clear and concise for the respondent to, to take your survey and understand what is being asked of them when they are going through the conjoint question type. The next thing with the task counts, um, the number of conjoint cycles you want to, sh want to use should, um, should be shown to the respondent. So uh, this will allow you to control the number of cycles or pages that you're going to show this question. And then the last definition there is the concepts per task, which is the number of concepts or packages you want to display on each cycle or page. So here's a screenshot of the setup. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the first thing you do is go ahead and add in your headers and instructions, and then after that you would break down your features here. So for instance, for donuts, you're looking at ingredients, flavor, pricing, toppings, filling, etc. And then below there, you're looking at the levels. So from the ingredients, you can break it down even further. You can look at organic, gluten-free, vegan, I don't give a hoot as long as it's good, etc. And you continue to break that down as you go along. And here inside our system, you can then set up the task counts. So I set it up here um, in this screenshot, three pages of conjoint questions that they'll see consecutively. And then uh, the concepts per task, you'll see three options per page to choose from. And you'll also be able to turn on a not applicable choice or an NA choice if you like. If they decide that they don't like any of the choices that are being shown, they can choose that as well. Additional setup definitions, we also include prohibited pairs, which prevent specific levels from showing up as part of the concept. So in this screenshot, you'll see that I'm never going to sell a donut with bacon on it for $1.75. I'm never going to sell one for $2.25. And I'm never going to sell combinations of lemon and bacon, vanilla cream and bacon, or raspberry jam and bacon. I don't know, for some people that might sound good, for others it might not. It might not be such a great seller to put that product out, so I'm not going to sell it. So you can, you can uh, do that in our system, and, and even though you're using the random or deoptimal design, you can add some restrictions in terms of what you want and not want to use as part of your combinations. Also in our system, uh, we do have what's called fixed task options. And this allows you to set up a controlled concept or, or and also test against random or deoptimal generated concepts. So in this example here, for the first task out of the three that you might have, you can say, you know, for the first one, I want to know how uh, the vegan uh, maple donut for 450 that's going, you know, how is that going to do in comparison to or an organic chocolate donut versus a I don't care lemon flavor donut, you know, so you want to know how that's going to do and then you, you want to have the rest of the task be randomized by the system, then you can also do that as well. 
If you'd like to add some tips for respondents, you can also do that as well. So if you want to add additional pictures or information um, while they're taking the survey. Um, so for instance, you know, what if you want to add bacon on top of your donut here? Um, you want to show a picture of what that's going to look like then you can also do that in our system as well. So what you would do is you would upload the picture into the system and then open up a, um, after you build the question type, you can click on um, each one of those individual um, features or levels and then add a um, pop-up window with the picture as well as any additional description. So um, in terms of being able to formally educate your clients in terms of each of the levels and features they, that they can click on those and fully see um, you know, how you're defining each one of these items. And if you like to go ahead and validate this, the conjoint, um, you can do the validation available underneath our survey overview. And so you would make everyone be required of answering every single question. So at Survey Analytics, we specialize in three types of design for choice-based conjoint. Um, the first one here, and also our very most popular one, is the random design. And this design is purely random sample of the possible attribute levels. So for the number of tasks per respondent, um, Survey Analytics will produce a unique set of attributes and configurations to be presented to the respondent. So once you set up your question, you'll go into the settings, and then you can choose the design type. Um, below there, you'll see is a concept simulator. And so if you have a client that asks, well, if I have 25 people, approximately how many times are these features and levels going to be shown? Then you can easily answer that and say, you know, this is the approximate time, amount of time people are going to be seeing this and that. And it's, it's a fairly even keel across the board. The next design option that we have is specifically for those who are using a very small um, homogenous targeted group of respondents. So if you're looking at very, very small people, like 100 people or less, we have what's called a deoptimal design. Um, it is a design algorithm that will produce an op optimal design for the specified number of tasks per respondent and sample size. And it's used. Um, a desired set of experiments to optimize or investigate a studied object. So basically what that means is that if you go into your task counts and you put three and three um, <clears throat> and you choose the optimal design, it's going to let you know whether or not that's going to be a good design. So here, uh, for example, I've picked uh, seven task count and four concepts per task and also allowing for not applicable. Um, and once you hit the optimal, um, then it will show you whether or not that can be taken in or not. And if it doesn't, then you'll just need to go back and change your task counts and your concepts per task until it will accept a design. And then from there, it will then produce a page in which you can see um, at each task count, you know, what kinds of concepts are going to be shown to each person at each uh, at each um, cycle. The last design that we have here that's actually starting to grow in popularity is the import design. And we um, reserve this for very statistically savvy clients of ours who want to design their own conjoint project and have self-determined through your own calculations whether the design will yield um, a significant output. Um, it isn't just for anyone putting a design and putting it all together. You really have to take into account, you know, the understanding of, you know, how many times a feature and level is going to be shown and in what process as well. And so to do that, um, you still need to go in and add your features and levels just like everyone else in that last screenshot. But then after that, you can go inside the import design and you'll see here that um, underneath the notes for every level and every feature, we um, code each one of those. And so what you'll do is then you'll download a, an example import template and then from there you'll be able to 
decide, you know, at what task count, what concepts you would like to upload. And then from there, you'll be able to um, import it back into the system and it will take it and then run your conjoint based off of your own um, imported design. What sample size should I use? Um, this is a question that comes up very frequently when it comes to getting started with a conjoin. Uh, and Richard Johnson, which is one of the inventors of conjoin analysis, has presented a following rule of thumb for sample size and for choice-based conjoin. And so that is uh, NTA divided by C, which is greater over 1,000, where N is equal to the number of respondents times T, which is the number of task counts, times A, which is the number of alternatives per task, divided by C, which is the largest number of levels for any one attribute. So for example, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> you'll see 500 respondents, three tasks per respondents, two alternative tasks, and a maximum number of levels um, on the attributes is three. So you'll get um, you know, 500 times 3 times 2 divided by 3 equals 1,000. And generally speaking, sample size, you know, can be around 200 to 1,200. And um, a lot of times people say as long as you have at least 300 respondents, um, you can run a random design conjoint analysis. Um, and so that's the number that usually people will start with. However, if you know you're going to be working with a very small group of people, then I would recommend using the deoptimal design. Are you ready for conjoint? Um, oftentimes, um, I will run into working with some clients who think that they're ready for conjoint, but upon further examination, it looks like you know certain things aren't quite there yet. So what we would do is we will go back and use some pre-conjoint research, you know, quantitative and both qualitative, to solidify what those features and levels are. So um, the very first thing you need to think about uh, if you're ready for conjoint is are your features and levels do they appear to be concrete? You know, features and levels should be set in stone, otherwise, you know, more research is required to help define the features and attributes list. So you can't continue on until you have that fully figured out. Um, and that even includes, you know, possibly having to need to shorten the features and levels list. That's probably the hardest part out of the conjoint design that I, I have to sometimes tell people, um, especially with choice base, you really don't want to put too many in there because then you're going to have to get more respondents, you're going to have to run more uh, task counts and concepts per task, mm -hmm. and we definitely want to try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, do the, uh, the second one you need to think about is do the options appear to be clear and simple to understand? Um, if no, you may want to use the presentation text or the pop-up hyperlinks, which I showed you how to do, to clearly define those features and levels. Um, another option, you can also redefine the features and, and attributes using vocabulary, you know, familiar to the audience. So, for instance, if you're using features and levels that this target audience that you're trying to go for isn't familiar with, then maybe looking or searching for different words and concepts that they are familiar with will help them with the decision making that they would need. Third question I think about is what is the estimated sample size? Um, you should definitely keep that in mind while you're, before you're running your project. And so based on the number of completes that you would need, um, you should decide ahead of time which choice-based design to run. Um, typically here with the, this estimated sample size, it's, it's choosing between random or deoptimal or the import design. Um, usually, I would definitely say if you're going to go, if you need a lot, random design is the best. If you know you're working with a small amount, then deoptimal is going to give you a very good statistically significant output. Some additional tips for you to consider um, if you're ready for conjoint is, you know, make sure that you're thinking about doing no more than 20 trade-off exercises, and that's quite a bit of exercises. Um, no more than five or six attributes, maybe even up to seven, and try to keep the ranges simple. So, um, you know, make sure that the concepts and the ideas are not too far-fetched and requires um, the respondent to think 
uh, further beyond than they absolutely need to. And that's going to help you with getting some really good data to look at at the end. So let's go ahead and take a look at the conjoint data review. And this area here, we're just going to focus in on the analysis side of the conjoint after you receive some data to work with. The very first thing that you will look at is the uh, relative importance calculation. And basically, this will calculate the percentage of which the particular feature and its levels have influenced the concept choice made by the respondent. And for each attribute, the difference between the highest and the lowest parts worth is calculated. And this value is divided by the total across all the attributes, and that is the relative importance. And you should see that below here um, <coughs> under the um, relative importance features. So you can note that, um, that we have the ingredients, and then the flavors, and then the pricing. And that actually pricing is the most... Uh, uh, it's got the highest relative importance out of all of them. The next thing here is the parts worth calculation. And the parts worth calculation determine which levels within a feature are more valued than others. Uh, here at Survey Analytics, we use the maximum likelihood calculation coupled with the Nelder Mead simplex algorithm to get the parts worth calculation. If you'd like to read more about this, we'll send the slides out. You can go ahead and um, click on those links if you'd like. And this is just a really quick uh, screenshot of what the light, the uh, likelihood measurement uh, calculation that we've programmed from the back end. And so with the parts worth here, you can see, um, especially with the particular items, you know, you're targeting, um, you're, it's taking into account every time someone chose an item with that particular level in it. And the higher the value, the more um, the more it's preferred versus uh, it, the lower the number it's least preferred. And so if you just take a quick peek at this, you can look at the first one, which was ingredients, and you can see that we have organic, gluten-free, vegan, and don't give a hoot. And you can see that most people, when it comes to donuts, they don't really care. They just really like their donuts. So that's really interesting to know. <coughs> and you can break it down as well. You see a vegan is really not that popular, followed by gluten-free. So, um, so you can take a lot of analysis from just looking at the, the values. And um, usually, instead of uh, comparing the actual numbers, you're just looking really at the, the, the weight of that value. And, and then that's where you would do a lot of your analysis from there. The next thing that we will provide for you is just a very simple best and worst profile. It highlights the best, um, the highest parts worth values and then the lowest parts worth value. So instead of having just to look at that graph, we automatically give that to you. So as I said earlier, it looks like people really don't care as long as it tastes good. Um, and that's probably fairly true with most donuts, I think. Um, so the best profile here we've got, we don't give a hoot, it's Mary and Berry for $1.75, no toppings, um, vanilla cream, <clears throat> and they want to buy it in the morning. That sounds like a pretty darn good donut to me. Whereas in the donut that's not doing so well is that vegan chocolate for three twenty five with raspberry jam and, and buying it in the evening. It seems like not a lot of people are looking at donuts as dessert, so probably not a good time to sell that donut. The next item that we have in our tool is called the Market Segmentation Simulator. And the Market Segmentation Simulator gives you that ability to predict the market share of new products and concepts that might not exist today. And it also gives you that ability to measure the gain or loss in market share based on the changes to existing products in the given market. Um, keep in mind, though, that with the simulator, it gives you a good estimation of what approximately is, might possibly happen. Um, it's not a full indicator, but it still is a lot of fun to, to see. So a lot of times people think that with Conjoint, you're going to be showing these ideas and things that, and you're going to control it all the way. But in reality, the simulator is where you're going to have all that opportunities to test certain things. So say, for instance, if you went back to that best and worst profile and you say, oh, those, those donuts sound great and all, but I'm never going to sell a Marion Berry donut for $1.75. So 
what is my next best option? So using the market segmentation simulator is going to get you to that answer and say, you know, with that out of the way, what what's my next best option? That's going to give me a lot of market share. <clears throat> Some important steps to consider when doing conjoint simulation. The first one you want to describe and identify the different products or service um, or concepts that you want to in investigate. And we call those profiles. For example, here, this picture, um, we're looking at a vacation package with an on-site wedding, a zoo visit, swimming with the dolphins, and a spa. That sounds like a great vacation to me. Um, the next thing you want to do is just find out if there's any existing products that are currently available in the market segment and simulate the market share of the products to establish a baseline. So in a way, I kind of like to look at it like it's a photo hunt. You know, like what about it is, is constant here? What's different over here? How is that going to change? You can do that in, in the conjoint simulator because you can, you know, simulate, hey, my competition has a package similar to this and I'm thinking about this package instead. How is that going to do against each other, against this target uh, respondent group that I, that I already surveyed? So those are really good things to think about um, and add and consider when you're doing the simulator. The third thing you want to do is try out some new services and ideas and see how the market shift uh, market share would shift you know based on new products and configurations. I like to think of it as being someone who's going to be in the kitchen making up a new donut idea um, that wasn't really thought about before and it's it's not it's not a bad thing to think out of the box and certain things. You'd be really surprised you know if you see that certain um, parts worth level are, are surprisingly high then, you know, put that together with some lower ones and see how that, you know, will um, come out in comparison to other profiles that you're putting together. So to do the simulator setup, um, you would just need to go into the system and click on our online tools and then name the simulator profile and then you can update and change your profiles. So for example here I've got two profiles of different donuts and we're looking at uh, ingredients like gluten free, chocolate, I want to sell that at 325 with no toppings and vanilla cream and I want to sell it in the morning. How is that going to do in comparison to the I don't give a hoot ingredients uh, with the maple bacon at 325 and also raspberry jam. How's that going to do? And so all you have to do is just click on, you know, after you set up all your profiles, and you can have up to 10, um, click on it and then you can go ahead and see the results here. So you'll see here that after I run the results, we have a simulation output below. And based off of uh, the 309 people that have taken this survey so far, I um, you can see that um, profile two is still very popular. Um, however, you know, the gluten-free donut is not too far off, so it would be something that would be beneficial to possibly sell um, in the morning and make some money. And you can keep simulating as many times as you like. So, um, and so you, this is an area that, you know, if you're working with uh, another client, you know, they're going to have a lot of fun um, playing around with this. So the next section here, we're going to go ahead and jump into the max difference scaling. And um, basically what the max difference scaling is, um, is that it assumes that the respondents will evaluate a, a big list of um, attributes and choose a pair of items within the displayed set and choose the pair that reflects that maximum difference in a preference or importance. Um, it also offers a comparative judgment um, that can be easily performed even when the number of attributes are not so small. And you can have up to 30 or maybe even more in our system, I think. Um, so um, after that, the task, you know, that represents um, the respondents with a set of items, you know, usually three or six or maybe even more, it basically simply asks them to select the most preferred and the least preferred. And another name for MaxDiff, if is also called best worst scaling. Uh, respondents can typically handle a number of these evaluations and may be asked to respond to a series of MaxDiff questions to gather more preference data. So MaxDiff versus rating scale. I'll definitely say that out of 
a lot of the question types that we have available. MaxF is a really great question, but it's very underutilized in comparison to the rating scale. And we're hoping that by showing you the benefits of this, you can consider using it in lieu of the rating scale or along with the rating scale so you can get some additional insights. So with MaxSIF, there um, has l much less respondent fatigue compared to a rating scale question. Um, and survey fatigue is so low that you can even run up to 15 or 20 different MaxSIF questions in a survey. Um, I've worked with clients who have literally created an entire survey and just MaxSIF questions uh, with an intro and a thank you at the end, and they got some great results from it. Um, and and basically, the reason why you're able to run so many of these um, versus doing a rating scale is because it's really easy for people to choose um, on both spectrums what they like the most, what they like the least, or love-hate combos. Anything in between is a little sketchy sometimes, and it's hard for people to quantify what that would be. Um, the max of scaling or share preference data is in a percentage of um, 100 percent or 100 point count. So you can see in this um, screenshot here, actually not this one, uh, but the following one here, that there's a 23 percent preference for the Seahawk player uh, Russell Wilson versus 20 percent for Marshawn Lynch. So that means that you can analyze and conclude that there's a 3 percent difference in preference between the Seattle Seahawks players. Uh, in a rating scale, it really is hard to measure what a 4 out of 5 versus a 2 out of 5 really means. I mean, sure, you can say that there's a 2 point difference, but in reality, what does that 2 point really mean? And, and so rating scales in general are a little bit more difficult to quantify than the max diff data output. So that's why we would encourage you to consider taking on a question like this, because percentages um, are a lot easier to measure. And not only that, but you can also you know, combine different ones, um, different uh, attribute lists together and see how that changes across the board. Some max diff FAQs. Um, so there are two big questions that come up every time I work with a client on MaxDiff. The first one is, can I set up a, an experimental design where the total items are larger than the items presented in a single screen? And the answer is a resounding yes. Um, you can use a large list of attributes and specify the number of attributes per page if desired. And so, for example, if you're going to be running 30 attributes, um, but you only need to show five at a time. So that is definitely possible to do, and you'll be able to run it in different cycles until you get through all 30 of the attributes. If you decide that you only want to show um, 15 out of the 30 attributes per respondent, then you'll also be able to specify that as well and then that will be able to adjust the, the needed cycle that's going to happen. The second question that we get a lot is, what kind of a utility estimation model does the system use to calculate the share of preference? Um, and we here, we use the multinomial logit model. And that was created, uh, co-created with the director of analytics over at um, ORC International, Chris Robson, and um, he verified that the calculations are very good to work with. And so we can definitely stand <coughs> behind our system and the output that we're giving to our clients as well. And so here's just a quick snapshot of the logic model that we use from the back end and have programmed in. So to set up the next if, what you want to do first is go ahead and create the question, put in your question text, um, and anchor your most and least preferred. And then after that, um, you'll want to go in and add your names um, or the different attributes that you would like. And again, you can have up to 30. And if you'd like to add images, you can also do that as well. And after you set up the question, the next thing you'd want to do is go into the settings of the question. And that is where you would be able to go in and set up whether or not you want to randomize the attributes list. And then below the attributes um, settings, you can set up a maximum attributes and then attributes per task. 
And then, for example, um, all equals all attributes that you test. So if you have 30, then all 30 is going to be test. Um, if you have, um, you want to test less than that, you can do that. So, for example, if you want to do uh, 6 out of 9, then only 6 out of the 9 on that list is going to be shown to each respondent. And then below there are the attributes per task. And that's how many times, how many of the attributes will you see on each page. So, for example, here if you have three attributes per task and um, you want to test all of them, then you're going to um, have nine cycles if you have only a list of nine people. So let's go ahead and set that up here with the attributes at all and attributes per task is at three. And we're just going to use a fun example here. Um, since we are headquartered out of Seattle and we're very proud of our Seattle Seahawks, I figured this would be a really fun one to do. And so here you can see um, we're only showing three Seahawks players and then from there the people can choose which one they like the most and which one they like the least and you'll see that the answers will move over so they know which answers they picked and you'll also see that there's a, a thumbs up and thumbs down as well we also support images on the max stiff as well so it looks really nice and for <coughs> my cincinnati office they're big cincinnati reds fans so i thought it'd be fun to uh, look at some logos and, and add those as well so for here you know which cincinnati reds logo do you prefer um, it looks really nice here you want to make sure that if you are using images to pre-size them ahead of time before you upload it into our system um, and then once you pick the answers, you'll see that the answers, uh, the images will also move alongside with the pictures that you choose. So it's a, a really nice look and feel that you, you get to work with. The next thing we're going to look at here is the max diff analysis. Um, and basically, uh, as I said earlier, um, we we with the max diff output, it's usually represented um, in either a 100 point system or in a percentage calculation that would add up to 100%. And here at Survey Analytics, we use the percentage calculation mode exclusively. Um, the breakdown that we have here is with the most or least preferred. So you can see each end of the spectrum is calculated um, separately in most and least preferred tables. So with this example picture here, you can see that. Um, for least preferred player, um, so not surprisingly, a lot of people don't like Richard Sherman because um, he, he's a very good player, but he could be a little arrogant at times. So some people might not like that compared to other players that are on the team. Um, so that would make sense. And then here's a, an example of the most um, breakdown. And you can see here out of all the players that we have, uh, the quarterback, Russell Wilson, is the most preferred, and, and he's a very good player, and also um, off the field, he's also a, a big person in the community, so I can see that people really like him a lot, um, and not followed behind um, so far as Marshawn Lynch, because he's an amazing player as well, so, um, and you can do the calculations and the um, analysis and review that, you know, there's a 3% difference between the most and second preferred player and then also you can uh, run analysis and see um, you know Earl Thomas and, and Doug Baldwin has a 3% as well and so there's a lot of really different things that you can do with the um, percentage mode and if you need to combine the calculations together you can say like these two are the most preferred in this calculation and this followed by this percentage and this is the difference between these two versus these two um, so that's a really powerful thing that you can do with the max diff analysis. The last thing that we're going to show you uh, when you're on the screen there is the overall percentage uh, pie chart and <clears throat> basically that gives you the overall percentage calculation in which it'll point out which particular attribute um, is is the most influential um, or gives them the most uh, the maximum difference out of all, every single thing um, so in this particular screenshot we have Golden Tate and it uh, looks like yeah Golden Tate looks like he's the um, the main one that you know people either love or hate him um, but either way, he's very he's picked either way. Um, so that's something to consider. So let's go ahead and take a moment here, and we'll go into a live demo of both the conjoint and the max div. 
and so I have an, all these examples set up in the account here. Um, if you can't see my screen, you know, just let me know, or Gina, if you just let me know, and I'll be able to adjust as needed. Um, so right now here is our random design that we've built. And the only thing you'll really need to do is you'll just go into the question and um, click on the um, click on the template, and then there you can go ahead and add your headers and instructions, your features and your ingredients, different levels, and so on. And then you can set up your task counts three by three, and then save your question. And once you save that, then you'll be able to go into the next item that we spoke about, which is the prohibited pairs or the fixed test. So once you have that built live, you'll then be able to go into your prohibited pairs. And then this is where you'll open up and set up actions of things that you don't want to show up. So if you know for sure you don't want to sell bacon donuts at $1.75 or $2.75 or with lemon or vanilla or raspberry, you better put those in there. <laughs> um, so, so then once you set that up, you can also add some additional as well. So it's a pretty unlimited area. After that, you can go ahead and update your fixed task if you like. Um, this isn't necessary. This is usually for those who have a concept that they absolutely want to test and see what kind of results they're going to get. Um, but then you can set that up, and you can also include additional tasks. So if you have three tasks and you want to uh, fix it, you know, on other pages, you can. I usually recommend probably doing one if you can, um, but not necessary. If you just leave those blank, those will be fine as well. And then, of course, if you would like to go in and add pictures or additional things, um, you can see you just have to click on these names here and then you can add copy and paste your images and then add some additional um, information so here we can type in the famous bacon maple bar I'm not sure if anyone um, is familiar with voodoo donuts but it's very popular and a lot of tourists always have to come and have some of these uh, donuts are pretty darn good uh, no matter what time of day. So <laughs> hopefully this uh, has made you guys pretty hungry for donuts. Um, so you can see that you can open up and add some additional information and show some pop-ups as well. Um, so once you set that up, next thing you'll do is go into the settings of the question. So you open up the template, click on settings, and here is where you would add your design type. So for this first one here, we have random, the optimal, or import. And so you can choose which one you'd like. Um, and then you can update that as, as well. Um, so here's one with just regular um, random design. And then I just use the simulator just for fun. So you can have an idea of how many times each of these levels will be shown um, if you were to target 25 people. Um, here's another example with the, the optimal design. <coughs> Excuse me. And so once you set up the, the optimal design, then you'll be able to see that um, task list. Oops. So here's a de-optimal, <clears throat> and if we go back here, you can see that I have 7 and 4, but what if I changed it to 3 and 4 concepts and saved it, and I wanted to run a de-optimal? Um, the system will let you know whether or not you can do that. So click on de-optimal, and you can choose how many versions you would like. I'm just going to go with one for now. And then we'll let you know if that is going to work well for this particular. And it, and if it does work, it will tell you, you know, how many task counts um, and what's going to be shown at each one of those. You can go ahead and save that. And the last one here is the import design. So once you set up the question type, just like the other options as well, including the number of task counts, even though you're controlling, you know, what's shown at each task count, you still need to put in your task counts and your concepts for task group to make this work. And then after that, you just click on your settings, 
and then here with the import design you'll be able to see specifically um, you know what kind of codes you're going to get for each of the levels and those are what you're going to use uh, for your design so after that you download the template update, update it and then uh, choose your file here and then you can import your design and then you're ready to go So that's with the setup with the conjoint. And then, of course, with the conjoint analysis question types, um, you can include this as part of a comprehensive survey. So you can build other question types. Um, you're not limited to just conjoint alone. Um, so you can build a very comprehensive survey, pick all sorts of different question types. You have well over 52 plus questions that you can choose from um, as well. So lots of things that you can do. Um, it's very flexible. So let's go ahead and take a peek over at the analytics side. And um, you can see under the analytics here, we actually got some really good information like what browsers they took it on, what tablet they took it on, what operating systems they took it on. Um, but let's scroll down a little bit more to the analysis and select conjoint analysis. And from here, we'll just pull up the report. Um, one good thing about our tool is that not only can you just look at the full report of the conjoint, but if you create some segments such as, you know, men versus women or different age range or, you know, if you have some information like how long they've been a customer with you, um, you can set up the, the segments and then also um, look at the conjoint data for those particular segments. So that's a really powerful thing. I think a lot of people really enjoy um, using that and so they can look at the overall but then they can see how these segments respond and what their conjoint output is as well. So let's go ahead and view the report here. Okay. So you can see earlier here we have your, um, we've highlighted the relative importance and which particular feature is the main determinant for which donut they pick. And so we've determined that price is the number one, uh, followed closely by, uh, you know, ingredients actually. So that's pretty interesting. Um, and then you can scroll down, you'll automatically see the best and worst profile. And then below here is the table in which we break down the relative importance percentage and then your parts worth. So you can do some additional analysis um, as well. So you can compare and see, you know, how vegan versus gluten free. So it looks like gluten free is still more popular than vegan, surprisingly, um, in here. So, uh, and you can do the same thing as well for everything else. And then after you're done analyzing this, um, you do have download options. So we do offer the raw data export for you. So if you decide you don't want to use our tool, but you want to use a different kind of tool, or you want to do your own analysis, we do have it available. Um, we do have it in our regular raw data. So if you want to download all the raw data from the entire survey with other question types in it, you can pull it from the export data here. If you're interested in just the data for conjoint, you can just pull it from here with the download options. Um, we do a, a report where you can do an export display concepts. Um, and so you can see what was shown for each person and what they chose. So you can analyze why. Um, and then we'll also look at some fixed task raw data as well as market segmentation exported data. So if you have particular people or particular segments you, you've created, then you can download those as well. Um, the one tool to the next, uh, to the left of that, would be where you would find the market segmentation simulator. So go ahead and, you know, set up a new account here. And so we're going to open up the profiles that we want to build. And then what we can do here is we can pick, you know, organic versus, um, I don't want to care. And then we can do uh, Marion Berry versus a lemon. And then we can sell uh, organic, usually is more expensive than the non one. 
Uh, we have there's a there's such thing as organic bacon, so we'll do that. Let's see, no toppings. And so if you build a profile of these items here, um, you can also add a name. And scroll down and click on Save Profile Changes and Run the Simulation. And next we'll be able to see the output. So you can see out of the 429 people who took the survey, that uh, profile one um, is not as popular. People actually... Uh, um, really don't care about what kind of ingredients they are using and they like the price so they're um, going to be more likely to buy that lemon donut versus that Marion Berry bacon donut. Um, and then you'll be able to uh, download the results from here as well. And as I said earlier you can set up up to 10 profiles and you can save them, you can save different profiles and, go, and you can jump back and forth uh, as you would like. Um, so it's really a lot of fun, and I would encourage you to, you know, run a test one and then go inside here and, and do some simulation outputs uh, before you uh, officially launch. You may want to have, you know, some decent amount of data in there so you can run, um, you know, a really good uh, profile. So you can notice, you know, your market shares, uh, and then you can also change. So if you say, well, I don't give a hoot that I'm changing this, um, and then, but I want to sell it at the same price, how is that going to change? So now you can see that the, the thing has changed just quite a bit, so there must be something else inside there that's causing, you know, people to still want to keep going for that second profile. Um, so have a, a lot of fun with this section. I think people are going to really enjoy this. Uh, so so let's go ahead and jump over to the Maxif question here with pictures. And you'll see here that the very first thing that you would do is you add up your question text, your most and least preferred, and so on, and go ahead and save that. Once you save that, you want to go into your settings. And this is where you'll be able to set up the maximum attributes and the attributes per task and it's really easy to do so if you decide you only want to test you know six out of the nine you can do that um, but here we're saying that out of the nine options that we have we only need three to be shown at one time so that means you're going to be cycling through this question three times and then below here if you'd like to add images then all you need to do is upload it and then pick the right images that will go with each one of these. And I forgot to do a simulation, uh, the user experience for the conjoint, um, but that's fine. This is what the experience is for the MaxDiff, and we'll just go with that for now. So you can see how user friendly that is. And the conjoint is very user friendly as well. And once you have all the data that you would like, you just need to go into the analytics once again and scroll down to max diff analysis. and then you can pick the question you want to use. You can use as many MaxDiff or conjoint questions in your survey. Um, so you're not limited in terms of how many you want to use in a single survey. Um, so you can see here that we have the um, percentage pie chart above, and then we break down the preference analysis by least preferred, the attributes are in the middle, and then here's your most preferred. And then you'll be able to also export the Excel report from here. Um, and before we go, I do want to just quickly show you the experience of what the conjoint question will look like. I do kind of feel like that's important. 
So let's go ahead and do that. All right, here we are. So you can see I've already set up the concepts per task, and then um, I have uh, three concepts per task, and I'm having it go through four times. So you can see every single one of these, and then you can choose the one that you would like. So the, the experience is very user friendly. And then if you needed to click on anything um, and you had some information in there, you can click on these words um, or these features as well. And there you go. So that's just random design. Do you optimal design? It all looks the same. So um, as long as you have the same one, then it will um, work as well. I have I wrote that one. <laughs> None of them sound good. They sound gross. So, so you can go through that as well. So as you can see here, it's very user friendly. It's easy to understand. It's clear. A lot of it's controlled by you, the survey. Uh, the survey creator. So as long as these items are easy to understand and then you also give people the opportunity to clearly define that, then you'll be able to get some really good data from it. And then also use our tool um, to do the data analysis. Okay. So let's go ahead and conclude our presentation here with um, just some points. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, when you're doing research, obviously we're doing research so we can find ways to make more money. And with Conjo, you definitely can make more money. It'll give you um, the opportunity to allow your company to uncover some additional insights on consumer preferences on your current products or services. Um, and also you can use it on both new and existing product services or some new ideas that you're even considering. Um, one thing people have to ask, you know, do you need to create new products or services or repackage any existing or a combo combination of both? Um, Conjoint and Maxo can give you that insight in which you can decide, you know, hey, I've got these really wonderful products and services. Maybe I can combine it with some new concepts and ideas and make it something fresh that people would like to consider in, uh, purchasing from us. Um, it also will give you a strong and compelling argument um, to recommendations for your company and clients. So by looking at different market shares and different preference uh, calculations, you can, sh you can make a compelling argument and tell them, you know, these packages on this targeted consumer of people that spend a lot of money with us, um, these are things that we can really make a lot, we can, we can really um, get the most paying out of your buck from. Um, and as long as your conjoint and Maxif are very clear and easy for people to answer, then um, you can also add that and create a very comprehensive online or mobile survey and be able to review it with some past data as well. Um, so you can conclude that these people that took the survey, a similar survey, and they have similar answers, um, you can say that they possibly would have very similar market share uh, preferences or uh, different calculation uh, uh, preferences as well. Um, and last but not least, with, especially with survey analytics, our tool is, is very DIY. So um, you are in control of creating the survey, creating the Conjoy and the Maxif, and using it um, as part of your projects. Um, no consultants are required. However, you know you will be given an account manager that will be able to oversee you and assist you with the software and make sure that it is working properly. Um, but we do give you the proper training and, and also a lot of really wonderful resources to uh, use to get you started. 
um, for those who are familiar with conjuring, this really is a godsend. So you can go in and do what you need um, and then get out and move on with your life. So, because uh, we understand here that, you know, research is just um, a, part of the pro a part of the process. And at the end of the day, you got to make um, the research has to turn into um, recommendations. It has to turn into um, some significant data in which you can make very pivotal decisions in your company uh, and where you want to invest your money um, and, and where you're going to expect to get the biggest return on investment. Um, so with that said, you know, Conjo and Maxif really is a great thing to add on to existing projects that you have right now, um, especially if you're looking to um, make just a little bit more money there uh, as well. So, so basically, we are all done with our presentation today. Um, so I do want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, if you um, are interested in getting started, you know, please make sure to contact our survey analytics sales rep, um, and my and their information there um, is available to you. So that's their email and also their. Um, their phone number. If you have any questions you'd like to speak to me directly, feel free to email me as well. I'd be happy to help you. Um, there's a picture of my dog and I. <laughs> he likes to uh, sit around and watch me work all day, so uh, we're kind of in this together. Um, so, Gina, is there any questions from the audience today? We're yes. We're a little bit over, but. Actually, we, we have a ton of questions, actually. Um, oh, and just to let everyone know, if I don't get to your question, I'm going to do them in the order they came in. I have copied down your name and the question you asked, and I'll work with Esther throughout the afternoon to assure we get you your answer. So um, the first question I'm going to go ahead and ask is... Can you do a data segmentation of the conjoint and or max diff results? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, with the conjoint, uh, as you saw earlier, yes, you can do a segmentation. So what you'll need to do is use our segmentation tool um, to create those filters that you would like. So if you're targeting particular customers or you want to uh, filter your males versus female customers or something like that. Um, you want to set those up ahead of time and then once you're accessing the conjoint uh, report, you'll be able to specify what that is. Okay, great. Thank you, Esther. And then another question we have, this is from Harsh, and it says, what all checks are available in data validation? What all checks are available? Mm-hmm. You mean in terms of being able to validate and check to make sure that the conjoint is correct? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, well, that's a really good question. Um, well, we do offer um, the uh, opportunity for you to test it out and then um, also um, in your survey overview um, tool, you'll be able to see if there's any um, issues with any branching or skip pattern. Um, I ideations that you had in your survey and so you, if there's anything that is not going to work in the system it will flag it as an error so you can fix those. Um, in terms of the conjoint itself to make sure that it would work, um, I would definitely recommend um, <clears throat> doing a test with your team um, and also if you want to work with your account manager to have them review it as well. Um, all, of our um, all of our account managers are proficient in conjoint. Uh, and if you really want to speak to me about it, I'd be happy to take a look at it as well. It doesn't take too long to go back and let you know, um, you know, what, you know, if your design is going to work with the choice space or not. Okay, great. Thank you, Esther. The next question is from Robert and is when should you use max diff versus discrete choice? Now, those are really good questions. I would definitely say that with conjure analysis, a lot of the um, features and attributes have to kind of coincide together. Whereas in with a max diff, they don't necessarily have to be all you know very similar things. Like I did use the idea of Seahawks players or Cincinnati Reds logos. However, you can easily ask you know whether or not you like this or hate this from a list of things as odd as dogs, puppies, Christmas trees, and, you know, 
uh, minions from Disney. You know, <laughs> you can go um, very eccentric with that list. Um, and then people would still be able to look at that list and say, you know, even though they're not the same things and they're not directly related to each other, um, I can still decide that I like puppies the best and I really don't care about, you know, minions from Disney. Okay, great. And we have one more. Are we required? I, I think you already answered this, but someone asked, are we required to pay for additional consulting fees to run a conjoint study? Um, well, that's a good question. I definitely say that our tool, first and foremost, is a DIY tool. If you are a very, if you're a first-time conjoint person, you really do want to get handheld, and you want to work with someone like me, um, you know, closely in terms of the training and getting you started. Um, that is something that you can work with a salesperson to build into your license, so that, um, and the cost of it really isn't that much more than what you would see in the market um, at this time. Okay, and since you know we're well over the time that this was supposed to cap off, I'm going to go ahead and close out questions. But again, a lot of the unanswered questions I have copied, and I will assure that Esther follows up with you later this afternoon by email. And at this time, I just want to say thank you for joining us. I will be sending out the replay and slides from today's presentation later this afternoon. So, and thank you, Esther. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.